Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, what we're going to do is just a quick introduction. Uh, originally, we were supposed to have uh, four of us, and the other two hightailed it back to D.C. for some reason. So uh, we're trying to figure that out. But uh, I'm Jerry Dixon. I'm uh, currently a director of analysis for uh, Team Cymru, a small security research team. Previous to that, I was the executive director for the National Cybersecurity Division at Homeland. Uh, basically, uh, that and uh, ran U.S. CERT for uh, a period of time. So. Uh, I'm one of those uh, recovering DHS alumni. Uh, basically, uh, we're going to touch on the Cyber Commission, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to introduce himself. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, we were going to do cardboard cutouts for the missing ones here and just kind of put their little faces up here. So if you took pictures, because it's 2D, it would look like we're all here. Speak up. How about if we do that? Is that better? All right. So anyway, Mark Sox is my name. I run the Internet Storm Center. How many of you have that as your homepage? Awesome, thank you. I see there's one reader out here. This is a good thing. I'm also a, f a former DHS, was there when we first launched. Uh, prior to that, I was 20 years in the military, retired back in 2001. Spent a couple of years at the White House working in the National Security Council. Early in the uh, current administration, uh, helped create Homeland. Lasted about six months and decided I really needed to go off into the private sector, which is where I've been for the last five years. What we're going to do is uh, let me go through about um, 20 minutes or so of a uh, little background just so you get where we're coming from with the commission, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. We can get a lot more, uh, lot more going there because we really would like to solicit some of your ideas. In uh, Washington, there's, of course, been a lot of bubbling over the years about whether cyber should be a part of any administration. Should the president himself be briefed on cyber issues? Is this presidential? If you watch, uh, like, uh, 24, you know, things like that, you, they always have, you know, ready access to the president. Every little thing that's going on, they're in there talking. Well, I can tell you, having been in that world, working inside the White House, it's not like that, not even close. In fact, one time we were able to get into the Oval Office, that's back when ASN.1 was a big deal. Do you remember that in early 2002? We lasted about five minutes. Uh, we were briefing the president on ASN.1. His eyeballs are rolling back in the back of his head. And, and he, he looked at us and said, so what can I do about it? And we like, well, Mr. President, you're supposed to tell us what you're going to do about it. And that's the point where we were then escorted back out of the Oval Office and never went back in again. <laughs> so, you know, lesson learned, you don't go in and brief the President on ASN.1 and expect him to understand where you're coming from. So this is a challenge for us, is how do you take our world and translate it into something that the, the executive of the United States of America can actually work with? And in fact, it's a challenge for just about anybody who has a, um, an agenda. Last summer, there was a series of unfolding events in Washington. Many of you have been reading in the press. You've seen uh, the large number of attacks that have occurred against the Defense Department, Department of Commerce, State Department, and countless others, as well as defense contractors, others in the industrial base that, uh, that help support uh, the nation. Those intrusions finally rose to the presidential level, and there was a, a briefing to the president, and he got very concerned about it, as you can imagine. The Congress was also briefed, a lot of concern there. There are a number of think tanks around Washington, D.C., one of which is uh, CSIS, and I'll talk about them in just a moment, uh, also concerned. So by the end of the summer, there was a groundswell of concern in Washington that something needed to truly be done about cybersecurity. We can no longer just keep talking about it, keep waiting on somebody else to fix it, that we really need to, to move forward. So CSIS, and this is an independent organization, it's a think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and they've long had a relationship with the federal government and with the private sector, proposed the creation of a panel, a, a blue ribbon commission, if you want to think of it that way, that would develop recommendations not for the current administration, not for the current time, but for the next administration. And if you think about this time last year, we did not know where we were going. The, the primaries had not started yet. Uh, we pretty much knew on the Democrat side it was going to be either Hillary Clinton or, or uh, uh, Obama, one or the other, but nobody really knew until just a few months ago. On the Republican side, it was wide open. There was lots of contention on the Republican side, no clear front runner. And that's where we started down this road, knowing that there was probably two on the Democrat side, but five or six on the Republican side, no idea who we're going to wind up with. So we used to always say, you know, we would brief this to Mr. or Mrs. President or Madam President once it's over with, because we, again, had no, no concept. 
So we kicked off back in October. Uh, we have always been wanting to keep this easy, just four or five things. In fact, if we can get it down to two or three, that might even be better. Things that we want to give to the President of the United States, the, actually the transition team, right after the election is over, when we know who the President's going to be, that says, here are the things you can do immediately, almost like a playbook for the United States of America to increase cybersecurity. Let me tell you a little bit, though, about what we are not, just to clear the air. There was concern when the commission was created that we would be like the 9-11 commission. In other words, our purpose in life would be investigative. We were there to find fault. We were to go back, you know, through the current administration, go back to the 90s, figure out why did all this bad stuff happen. That is not what we're doing. So just rule that one out. We're also not part of a separate but parallel effort known as the President's uh, Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative. This is what you'll hear of just the short term as the cyber initiative. That You'll hear that floating around. This was a, uh, and still is, a classified project, although many parts of it have uh, been made public. There's been press articles uh, out since last September. And, in fact, uh, Secretary Chertoff at RSA back a few months ago gave a fairly detailed discussion about what's in the cyber initiative. So if you want to know more about that, there's a lot of information now that's been made public. But that's not what we are. We're different. We're the CSIS Commission. However, many of the commissioners, and I'll show you how we were made up in just a moment, are in fact pro, uh, providing input to the various uh, portions of the cyber initiative. We are very much trying to keep these things separate, but we do know that when the same minds begin thinking about the problem together, we're going to have a lot of overlap. And in fact, once we get done, when our recommendations are handed over to the next president, many parts of these recommendations may say, keep doing what this initiative is doing. Don't stop. Just keep right on going. Or it may be that we've got some other things that the initiative is not in there, new starts, new things to, um, to think about. One of the first things that we did realize, though, that cybersecurity is a national security problem. There is a clear and present danger, folks. We as a country face a turning point here. I think all of you are aware of this. We have built an incredible capability. You know, we are the fathers of this global phenomenon of highly connected world that we live in. And so there's a bit of a, a challenge that we're facing now is how do we take this from being just the nuts and bolts world that we live in, the very technical community, and elevate it up to a strategic level important problem, just as important as nuclear warfare, weapons of mass destruction, fighting hunger, all the other things that we face is a very strategic and, and challenging challenging national problem. So what we have to do then is how do we elevate, how do we take cybersecurity, something that's seen as our world and just kind of pushed off to the back burners and bring it up to where it can compete and fight for allocation of resources, money, manpower, smart people like yourselves that can, uh, that can work together. And I think, in fact, that's our biggest challenge is how do we do that. So a little bit about our group. Bipartisan from the start, we've tried to do that. We've, we're as close as we can be 50-50 as to who represents the Democrat side versus the Republican side. But honestly, our political beliefs have been set, set aside. We're just trying to do this for the nation, not for any uh, particular party. We've got two congressmen. I'll, I'll give you their names and backgrounds in just a second that are working with us. And then behind us, it's uh, uh, over 100, and actually we're, we're approaching uh, close to 200 people now who have volunteered, people who want to help out, that are assisting the various working groups with the drafting of the, of the specific language that's going into the uh, recommendations. And in fact, if any of you are interested in assisting, we would love to have your help. We are pretty much at a point where most of the re recommendations now have been gelled out. We're now trying to take hundreds of pages of thought and cram them down into just a few pages, get it to uh, some nice, concise recommendations. Where we will really need your help is in about a month, we should have the first draft ready for public review. Please, if you could download it, take a look at it, give us some criticism back so that we can refine and make this uh, worthwhile. It's not our recommendations to the President, it really is yours. We've done the hard work and now we will need your assistance in making this refined as we, uh, as we get it ready. So here's our leadership. We've got uh, uh, Congressman Langevin, he's from Rhode Island. Uh, along with uh, Congressman McCall from Texas, both of them serve in the um, the House uh, sub, or the House Committee on Homeland Security in the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats, Cybersecurity, and Science and Technology. So this is the specific group in the House that worries about cyber things. As many of you may know, the Department of Homeland Security has a lot of oversight. There's over 80 different committees and subcommittees that have something to do with Department of Homeland Security. And in fact, there are many that feel that cybersecurity is theirs as well. This group has it specifically in their title. And in fact, they're the ones that have been holding the series of hearings over the past couple of years.
leaders uh, to find out more about what's happening in Homeland. Supporting them are two people from the private sector, Scott Charney over at Microsoft and uh, retired General Harry Radege, who uh, in his last incarnation was the um, was a retired three-star Air Force general and was the commander of DISA. He uh, commanded there for five years, one of the longest DISA commanders, uh, both of them with a lot of expertise and background and, and are assisting accordingly. Uh, let me go back one here. If, if you look at the bottom, you'll see the uh, website there, csis.org slash tech slash cyber. I'll put that back up again at the end of the slideshow. That's where we have more details, who the other membership are. I won't bore you with that on the slides. Uh, we've got some brief bios so you can see who else is uh, who's participating there. We started this, like I said, back in October, big press release, had a kickoff session shortly into November. Since then, we created a series of working groups, and those working groups have been giving many back briefs back to the larger group. We found this is better than trying to have 35 people all working as a big cluster. We've also had outside expertise, two really good sessions. We've got a few more that are scheduled throughout the summer. We've had intelligence community. We've had uh, foreign representatives come in, Defense Department, and other branches of the federal government has, have come in and worked with us, kind of giving their take on what they see, what the problems are, and, uh, and the issues. We have several more, like I said, that are scheduled throughout the summer, and then we begin to bring this to a wrap in uh, September. Let me just put the commission aside for a second and take a quick diversion into why we're doing this and how it challenging it is for us. So let me talk a little bit about how this works with policy, and you'll get a better perspective of, of, of what we're up against. If you remember back to 10th grade, remember Mrs. Johnson, your civics teacher? And Mrs. Johnson was explaining to you about how, the, how government works, and we've got the separation of powers and the three branches in your constitution. Remember all that good stuff? Yeah, okay. That's what you have to think about here for just a second. I know many of you probably dumped it after you left 10th grade, but this is what we're up against. We have the executive branch. The executive branch can give executive orders. They can sign decision directives. They can have uh, presidential signing on the bottom of bills. They can add things in there. It's very interesting what all the power that sits in the executive branch. Of course, that's more than just the president. That's also your departments, agencies, and others. We've got sitting over in the legislative world the, the, the power of Congress to appropriate, to enact laws, to, to do all the things that they do. And we have the regulators. Never forget them. I work for a very large regulated company, Verizon, and we are very concerned, as you can imagine, about the regulatory world. Many of you work in a regula uh, regulated world, so you're having that to, uh, to balance you. Plus, we have standards, things like what NIST and many others are putting out that the federal government has to adhere to. And then don't forget what the judges do as they interpret the laws and try and twist things hither and yon. All three of these are affecting all of us. Fortunately, though, we can rule out a lot of the policies that the federal government worries about. There's a lot of things that are internal, like staffing and funding and allocations. But unfortunately, cybersecurity, that's one of those areas that affects all of us. And it doesn't matter what the government comes up with. Any policy that has to do with cyberspace is going to affect us. And I should be, to be fair, it's not just U.S. citizens. It affects people beyond the United States in terms of the policies that they're developing. Many of you, if you're not working in the federal government, you're still subject to FISMA. If you're working in any type of organization that holds federal data, if you're storing it, managing it, otherwise you're, you're underneath FISMA, you've got standards that apply to you, et cetera. So it's, it's uh, quite a bit of... Um, of impact. If you want to speak, you have a microphone right there. Just sit down and speak, <laughs> Mr. Nixon. You know, I, I like to stand when I talk, anyways. Yeah, you do have this little standing up problem. So you know, obviously, he's going to interrupt my talk because I'm not being eloquent enough. Go ahead, Jerry. So just to give you an insight into how, because I had to live through this process for uh, the better part of eight years. There's what's called a policy coordinating committee. And when you're working to, when we were establishing U.S. CERT, and Mark knows very familiar back in the early days of DHS and trying to lay, you know, what, are the, what is the jurisdiction of U.S. CERT, what authorities is it going to have, and what's going to drive, you know, the mission forward and actually define that mission. So what a policy coordinating committee, which is actually ran out of the White House, and it can actually be chaired by anyone from the uh, National Security Council, the Homeland Security Council, or the Office of Management and Budget. And typically, in the case of when you're dealing with the executive branch or the, the federal agencies, OMB typically ends up being the chair or somebody from the Homeland Security Council if it relates to DHS. Well, something as simple as coming up with standard incident categories, incident reporting guidelines. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the data breach for the VA, for instance. There was a whole discussion on trying to set up uh, uh, re reporting related to uh, privacy breaches. This process is a very long, drawn-out process across all the departments. So you can imagine trying to get consensus from Department of Justice to state to DHS. And basically, you end up do going through multiple iterations. Well, to give you an idea of some of the time frames, 
just to set the incident categories and reporting requirements within the federal government, that took a year to get it approved and finally signed off on by all the departments. And I can't, there must have been probably 48 different rewrites of the actual uh, concept of operations for U.S. CERT. So it's not something that the government can turn on a dime. I'm sure most of you are aware that it's like turning a battleship. But I want to kind of give you a little bit of insight into that. Thank you, Jerry. Are you done? You demand. So when we look at some of the, the ways we go here, we can have a private sector solution or we can have a public sector solution. I think we all would like to have private sector solutions to everything in terms of cyberspace. Let the government go back to just doing what the government does well. But there are consequences. There's pros. There's cons on both sides. We would like to have a lot of competition in the private sector. Unfortunately, competition doesn't always allow for the best solution. It's the one that competes best or the one that they can make the most sales on. Government, unfortunately, has a lot of uh, advocacy groups that are out there trying to elevate their, poten their uh, potential ideas, their little pet rocks. They also compete with each other. In the end, the best approach, which many of us are very aware of, is some type of public-private partnership, some way of working together between the government and the private sector. And with cyberspace, you throw in that additional international dimension. As all of you know, a bit does not know whether it's sitting in the U.S. or Canada or China or Germany or wherever it is. And at the, nearly the speed of light, these bits of information flow around the, plant, the planet. So whatever we come up with here in the U.S. affects the entire planet. And that's one of these little lessons that we continue to try and push to our, uh, our, our counterparts in Washington. So there's many places we can look for policy, and all these places are going to be competing with anything we come up with. Anything the commission develops competes with all these other things that are out there. We have to worry about consumer protection. We have to worry about diplomacy. We've got to worry about all the other things that are happening. There are some interesting proposals, but we are not talking about this in the commission because we want to go presidential. Proposals like taking computer code itself and writing laws into it, making it, it computer code making things illegal. Very interesting idea. Uh, a little squishy there because then it makes it very clear black and white with no room for negotiation if your computer won't let you do certain things because the law says you can't do it. One example of this, an emerging problem, is the supply chain. As we are globalizing and as we're getting components and parts that are coming from all different countries besides the United States, how do we fix that? How do we make sure that what we're getting is, in fact, secure? We can let technology fix it. We can let politics fix it. We can legalize it. In other words, pass laws to make it illegal to ship uh, bad components. Or we can just let industry worry about itself. And you can see all four of these approaches compete with each other. There's no one particular approach that's better. Let me show you a few examples of the big high-level things that we think about, and then I'm going to get back into the, um, the commission. For example, at the national level, we don't have a response plan. Right now, if the United States came under attack, much like Estonia did this time last year with, with the Russian involvement, we do not have a plan, something we can turn to that says, here is how the United States responds to that. Now, that's incredible. How did we get to that point where we don't have that oversight? We have it in the nuclear world. We have it in countless other places, but we don't have it in cyberspace. So that's one of these police things that we're looking at. Well, we're getting a lot of noise from next door, but that's cool. Maybe we'll get some noise in here in just a second. We're also looking at global governance. You all know that nobody runs the Internet. It's a big get-along. There's no president of the Internet. There's no company that runs the Internet. There's the ICANN. That's names and numbers. But there's no real running of the Internet. And, in fact, what should happen presidentially should there be an effect on the Internet? Does the United States take it back over? Do we seize control? I mean, these are, these are kind of the interesting areas. Likewise, research funding. Research dollars, as you might realize, in cyberspace have been continuously going down. What a shame because so much of what's built this nation has been built on the backbone of research and has gotten us to where we are today, but that continues to dwindle. For yourself as individuals, privacy, big deal. For those of you who are sitting in here in the, um, the talk earlier, you know that that is, that is absolutely fundamental to how do we make this work for ourselves. We have to keep that in mind. Security, everybody defines security a little bit differently. Anonymity, and how do we protect your desire to be anonymous in cyberspace, balance that with law enforcement enforcement, counterintelligence, and others who want to know exactly who you are and what you're doing and what you're thinking. I'm not going to go through all these, but we could just keep going on and on and on with all the different things we can think about. But again, we have to, we have this challenge. We've got to boil it down to four or five things you can walk into the Oval Office, talk to the president about. 
Could you imagine what that would be like to actually sit down with the president and say, Mr. President, I want you to think about the following thing, or I need you to do this, this, or something else, and try and put it at that level when it's being balanced against the war in Iraq, against the illegal immigration, against the economy, against rising gas prices, all the things the president is really worried about, the things that make him lose sleep at night? How do you walk in and say, but sir, there's this thing called cyberspace? That's our challenge. This is where we're going to really need some, some help from you. And I look forward to the comments as we open up the microphones here in just a moment. So let me wrap up what we're doing, and then we can get into some good Q&A, unless Jerry interrupts me again, which I'm, I know he's dying to get back up here to do that. Actually, I do have one additional thing, but I'll wait till you're done. Oh, you can go ahead. No, no, go ahead. All right, then you'll wait your own turn. In fact, there's a microphone down there if you want to ask me a question. <laughs> you're welcome to do so. In fact, I might even I'm, I'm afraid of the response. Yeah, you should be. So our first round, we've divided this up into phases. Uh, phase one is in the history books now. Phase two is where we currently are, and phase three is coming up next month. Let me just show you a little bit about what's happened in the past. That first phase, we took all of us and looked back over our shoulders, said, where have we been? What has the federal government done over the last 15, 20 years with respect to cyberspace? Do we have any policies that have worked? Do we have any that were failures? What do you think we found? one big bucket that had a lot in it. That was the failure bucket. We've also looked at what are the threats. And I don't mean necessarily nation states or threat actors, you know, criminals, insiders, things like that. But what truly are the threats? For example, the lack of trained technology professionals that are working in the federal government. Is that a threat to the security of our nation? Is a supply system a threat? Is globalization a threat? Those are the kind of things we're looking at beyond just the obvious, is this particular country or is this particular company, in some cases, a threat to the security of the United States? We also tried to get a, a, a handle on the complexity, of which there are many because of all the overlapping corners of the world, who the actors are, who the players in the different parts of departments and agencies, and then some of the key infrastructures, and particularly telecommunication and electric, because those are your two areas that underpin everything about our economy. Without the power sector, without electricity, we wouldn't be here. Lights would be out, we'd be out on the streets. Without telecommunications, we wouldn't be here. There's no way that this building would run, the SCADA systems wouldn't work, nothing would happen. So without those two, nothing moves forward. But all of them depend on cybersecurity, as do the many of the other sectors. So with all that behind us, then we began looking at, all right, how exactly do we develop recommendations based on what we know is wrong? We have one group that's been working on federal organizations. Should we start over? Do we rebuild the parts of Homeland Security that do cyber? Do we have a cyber czar, for example? This is an idea that's been bubbling up and up. Should there be somebody like the um, uh, Surgeon General, you know, have a cyber general that's in charge of everything for cyberspace? Some have said, yes, that'd be great, need a lot of leadership. Others point back to the Internet example and say, yeah, but nobody runs the Internet. There is no elected king of the Internet. There's no potentate out there. We seem to all get along. So shouldn't we have a model like that in the federal government in terms of the security for the United States? So two really good competing thoughts there. We've also looked at the authorities, a, a group working on that. What legal mechanisms are standing there? If our nation comes under attack, if we have a situation like Estonia last year but multiplied to the size of the United States, what legal authorities do we have to respond? What can the private sector do? What does government do? Which organization actually picks up the sword, or does anybody pick it up? Or do we just build this big firewall around the United States and just close ourselves off? Is that the response? I think we've got a long ways to go before we get to an answer there. Also, acquisition, spending, how much money do we, uh, do we put into it? And then a group I've been working with, and this has been absolutely fascinating, and that's how do we build a stronger public-private partnership. We have some organizations out there, the InfraGuard, the ECTF, others that exist already, but none of them are providing the partnership that we really need where the federal government, rather than just governing the United States, is seen as almost like a business partner because their networks are just as fragile as your networks. And together, we need to be working to, get, uh, to improve the uh, security of our nation. I've actually just walked through all these, so that's you can read those later uh, uh, on your own. So the things we've looked at, this is a, the last one I'm going to, and we're going to move over to Q and A here in just a second. Is we've got to be strategic. We've got to be able to talk to the president. We can't come up with a list of little things like uh, we need to, per to fix this particular piece of software, or we need to use this type of email, or something. That, that's those are pebbles. If we go down that road, we've lost. 
we've got to have big strategic initiatives, something that might take years to undertake. Things like how do we change the way we do the educational model of our, of our children? Starting in first, second, third grades, how do we start injecting into them science and technology? The love of doing these things so that as they grow up, they can come back and be our future leaders. How do we get moms and dads more secure, small businesses, all that kind of wrapped together? Those are big strategic problems that we need to think about. Some of us have even proposed that we ought to lay out a roadmap for completely rebuilding cyberspace. In other words, looking at the argument that says many of the protocols that are out there developed, you take just the Internet as a, a piece of it, developed in the 70s when threat models were completely different, when we could trust people but we couldn't trust machines. Should we, in fact, make that a presidential initiative that the United States leads the way in building a new architecture for the 21st century to where we have a lot of trust now in the machines and we back off a little on the, on the people side? Because essentially what's happened is we've taken a small community, a little group of farmers that all got along with each other in small-town America, and we opened it up to the neighborhood and we've let the hood in, and look what's happened as everything has come in. So we need to rethink that. Those are big strategic motions. Jerry, your turn for a question, and then it's going to be your turn. There are two mic well, there was a microphone here. I guess there's just one there. So we need to know, what are your recommendations? What are your ideas? What can you do to tell us? So we can form a line right there. Please, Jerry. So just a, a quick correction. I, I don't want you all to think that there isn't a national response plan. There actually is one. It's a national response plan framework. And within there, there's what's called emergency support functions. And actually, the cyber piece of it rolled into what is called the, uh, the communications uh, support function, which companies like Verizon and others uh, work with what's called the National Communication System, or actually make up what's called the National Communication System. The challenge is that once you start digging down further in there, if you look at other sections, other emergency support functions, there's a little bit more detailed plans on how to react or respond to particular events. There's not a single group within the U.S within government, you know, or one agency, I should say, that can respond to multiple states that might be affected by a major cyber attack that's affecting delivery of public services or what have you. So that's kind of the challenge, is how do you, how do you address that issue? Uh, you know, maybe there needs to be a, a state level incident response capability each one of the states that feeds into a higher tier at, at the federal level to help respond on the ground. So those are some of the kind of things out there. But the key thing there is I wanted to make sure that there is a national response plan out there. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in that space. Right, we can respond to the nukes, but if our networks come under attack, who's in charge? It and it's back to the key point. So U.S. CERT is basically the focal point for uh, cyber-related issues, at least within the federal agencies and at the executive department. When you start getting into sector-specific areas, that's where, like, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission would step in. Or if it's something affected with energy, which would also include the energy department. There's a group, what's called the National Cyber Response Coordinating Group. It's basically bringing together all the major departments that have expertise in spe specific areas. So, like, FAA or the Transportation Administration. But again, you've got, there needs to be a better uh, detailed plans that come into place. I don't know how many of you read the after actions from CyberStorm. Those are some of the things that on the commission that we're taking a hard look at, at CyberStorm 1 and CyberStorm 2 and trying to glean the lessons learned from that so that we can make sound recommendations to the next administration. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that when, when this all started, there, there weren't any clear front runners from either party. Now that we have, you know, two, it's, you know, it's going to probably be either A or B, are there any, are, are there any plans? Yeah, gentlemen in the back says, don't forget Ralph Nader. Okay. <laughs> are, are there any, are, are there any plans or intentions to, to tailor this design towards one particular individual over the other. Is, is it going to be the same thing regardless of who gets elected? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. What, what we're trying to do, again, is to be party neutral. In other words, the President of the United States represents the entire country. Different parties elect through the political process their nominees. And, of course, you have two big front runners, Republican and Democrat, but like was mentioned in the back, there's more than just those two. Right. The odds of somebody else getting selected are pretty slim. It's going to be one or the other of those. We don't know which. But our job is not really to worry about who gets elected. Our job is to think presidential. And how do we turn over a roadmap, a plan, just something that's presidential, regardless of which party is elected or, or ultimately goes into the White House? But it seems as though the, the background of, of whichever individual would play into how it's presented to them, their own personal experience with technology or, 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 or Luckily, something like we don't that. have a lot to worry about there. <laughs> so I, I didn't know if, it, if there was, yeah. like, the, even the way it was presented or made clear to the yeah. individual. What's, see, what's unclear right now is we don't know who the staffs are. Okay. If you look at just the two leading candidates, Obama and McCain, 
neither of them are really techie types. Um, but both uh, Obama, a little bit younger, is more connected to technology just generationally than McCain is. But you don't see either of them out there doing the things that we do in an right. online, highly technical world. So then it becomes important as to who are their appointees, who are the staffs. Who knows? Okay. That, that gets determined way after the election. Okay. And a key thing to remember is that even when we produce these recommendations, I mean, they could totally ignore them. We don't have any kind of power oversight. Right. The good news is that it, since it's being sponsored by Congressman Langevin and Congressman McCall, they're going to be watching and seeing what the next administration does when it comes to cyber policy. As far as a, a recommendation... What? Unless you got a real quickie, we've got a line back there. So. Oh, okay. Sorry. Just go to the end of the line. There's, there's room. <laughs> yes, sir. If I work for a nonprofit that goes into communities, helps them set up and work together to help secure their cyber stuff, so in the world, recommendation. Right now, and simplification, but DHS hands out a lot of money to communities for security, different reasons. I can see where that if you would tie that into, they have to have certain gates they have to meet before they can get X amount of funding that you could help direct and in fact, implement. Could you give me an example of a gate? I mean, what kind of thing are you thinking out? Uh, amount of, of training that they have to obtain, uh, steps in the fact of, okay, here you have information awareness, then you go into maybe information, uh, say, cybersecurity uh, exercises and training, then you get to a point to where maybe you've got, you're working with other communities. Uh, and maybe at the point that that next community starts helping other communities develop their own So tie the program. amount of money that's being given for physical homeland security money to something that they're doing in cyberspace. Well, not only cyberspace, but other things as well. But cyberspace is one interest where maybe yeah. instead of just giving money for, you know, gratis, then tie it to something so they're actually seeing something production coming the, out the of it. The idea is wonderful. The reality, of course, is we're up against all these legislators that are elected to go bring money back to oh, the, understand. you know, and so to try and get, we'll try. Thank you. I appreciate well, the, it. The other piece of that is that the way the current grant process works is that a lot of the state governments, you know, the state governor, which is their own executive branch, does not want the, you know, the federal department, the federal department like Homeland Security saying how to apply or best use as federal dollars to protect their backyard, so to speak. Uh, you know, there's often been discussions about maybe saying one to two percent should be put towards cybersecurity within that state to help improve uh, the cyber, you know, protecting the cyber infrastructure there. It looks like you know, highway taxes have to be or highway grants provided for X if they do Y. You know, why can you do DHS the same way? You have to do X for Y. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm just giving you insight into kind of the way things have been going lately. Right. Is that they'll typically allot X amount of dollars to a particular state. Right. Then that state actually has, you know, whether it's the attorney general or the state police, the National Guard, they all compete for those same dollars as right. well as the local counties or municipalities. So it's right. so they've got a good business plan and the governor agrees and they're going to get the dollars. Let me add one more since you mentioned, go ahead and sit down. I'll, I'll just answer as you walk back. Because you mentioned highways, transportation, things like that, it's very easy in that world. We have lots of standards. We have AASHTO standards and highway building standards, things to refer to. So if I'm going to give federal dollars to build a new highway, a bridge, and so forth, I can build that according to a standard. When it comes to cyberspace, what's the standard? If I start allocating money, what do you build it against? Who goes out and checks it? Who validates that, in fact, what's being built is according to a standard? By the way, that's one of the things we're trying to get a grip on is, is that presidential? Does that rise up to the executive branch to try and do something? Now, obviously, the president's not going to sit down by the fireplace and start writing out cybersecurity standards. That's not going to, I hope that doesn't happen. That, that would not be cool. But whose job is it? Is it Homeland Security that does it? Is it NIST that does it? Is it DOD that does it? Is it NSA? Is it us? Does it turn over to the private sector? You say, write your own standards, and the government then enforces the private sector standards. That's an interesting approach. Not unlike what the uh, Consumer Affairs Division does over in, uh, in commerce when it comes to uh, consumer protection. And the other part of that is, should there be a cybersecurity agency? Like you have the Federal Communications Commission. Should it be a small agency that's focused and hopefully a little bit more agile than one that's working in, say, a large department. So that's, you know, kind of some of the discussions that's taking right. place. Now, Neil, we, uh, we are not worried about the aliens. <laughs> uh, we are not going to ask the president to give you the keys to Area 51. Actually, I was going to um, do that. Oh, you were going to ask that one. But if you want to ask something else other than about the aliens, we are welcome to listen. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Uh, with all the compromises of uh, government systems by a foreign government, are we already in a cyber war? Well, I, not, let me ask you what is meant by warfare. What is a cyber war? I Go assume, ahead. I assume it's a foreign government attacking us. A foreign government attacking us. 
Who declares cyber war? The cyber president? <laughs> <laughs> a cyber congress? Oh, well, I thought that's why the blue ribbon panel was created to. These are great questions. I keep going. <laughs> this well, is good mean, stuff. You know, it's a difference. You know, same thing with espionage. Espionage versus by an organized crime group or criminal group versus, uh, you know, war. War. You know, maybe there needs to be physical damage as a result of a remote based attack. I mean, there's a number of different things you can walk down. Uh, so it, it's a it's a challenging question. We've actually. You know, as Mark alluded to, back to the National Response Plan piece, there's actually not an overarching cyber doctrine. There is a national military strategy to deal with cyber, but there's not one that encompasses all of the government and all the departments. And that's something that we're putting forward, or one of the recommendations that we're actually considering. But, but you're bringing, you're, you're asking the right questions. The word war. You know, we have the war on terrorism. We have the war on drugs. We have the war on fat little kids that eat at McDonald's or <laughs> stuff like that, right? It, yeah, we still got a ways to go, right? Okay. So is it fair to say that there is a cyber war? You know, I mean, do we want to cheapen? Because war is a very dangerous thing. It's kind of like somebody earlier in a talk wanted to take the Cold War and say that this is a cyber Cold War. Well, the Cold War was a very dangerous time. We almost annihilated ourselves, nukes pointing at each other. In fact, we can still do that if we want to. I don't know that, we, that the word war is still appropriate. Let's reserve that for, for an appropriate time. So, are we in conflict? Yes. Do we have differences? Are there political problems? Absolutely. Are, are we at a state of war? Not yet. So with the state of conflicts, uh, what about escalation? At what point does it escalate? Yes. And so now you're going into the questions of diplomacy, something we are thinking of. And if you've got some ideas, what do we recommend to the president? How do we do this? How do we know when escalations are taking place. What ambassadors do we draw back if somebody attacks us in cyberspace? Or do we? Or do we bring a company back from India? We close all the Indian call centers, you know, if, if the attack comes from India. <laughs> these are these are great questions that we don't we don't know. If you've got ideas, let us and keep in mind, I mean cyber crosses a lot of different titles. So like Title Ten, DOD when we talk about war, Title fifty, the intelligence community and their authorities. Right. Title 18, criminal authorities. So that's why you often see in government these task forces that get set up so that each one of the departments can leverage those authorities to deal with any given problem set. Okay. Thank you, Neil. The end of the line is just back there if you want to step back to the end. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I thought you were sending me back to the end of the line. Thank you. Um, I could do that if you'd like. Do you feel more comfortable at the end of the line? <laughs> it's because I didn't get up yesterday. That's okay. what it was. Um, after this, this whole uh, DEF CON black hat cycle, one of the observations that I have is that um, we have a process called responsible disclosure, but we really don't have a process called uh, responsible um, response to that disclosure. Um, you guys are handling it pretty well, but as an example, we've, we've, I've sat in more than one discussion where vendors are fighting it out to say, you know, we're going to ship product whatever way we want to the consumer or whatever. But uh, I know that uh, the government's uh, produced the desktop, uh, the secure desktop initiative. Uh, NIST is actually headed up, that did a great job. Air Force was involved with it. It sounds like we really need to do that with any network devices. So what is the presidential the recommendation? The presidential recommendation is for NIST to be funded. Oh, you're not writing this down. I'm listening. Um, Jerry's got the notepad. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a great memory. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, I can add it to the slide if you want me to. A, a set of secure standards or at least a level of turning devices off, services off by default for all network devices. If across connects, America or across the federal government? For, for, across America by default by mm -hmm. vendors that actually sell into this country. I mean, procurement is the strongest power we have. We've heard it more than once from DOD. From the government, oh, we're not going to buy a unsecure desktop. Air Force had to actually taken initiative. But again, let's go. You're talking to Mr. President. Yes. What does Mr. President funding do? for NIST to continue with a desktop initiative Very type um, system? Okay, so use for NIST all for what NIST is designed exactly. to do and provide the funding. Exactly. See, that's presidential. Asking well, thank the, you. Telling the president, we need you to develop a list of all the things that are being turned off when I get my computer at Christmas. No, I'm just providing some not definitions. Do that, right? You're a smart guy. I'm just I know, providing I'm just definitions. With you. But yes, we can do, actually, because I'm up here and you're down there. This is you know, the relationship. I'm up there, too. That, that works. Yeah. Uh, no, basically just uh, defining the definitions because, as an example, I sat in a presentation with SCADA. There's yep. an argument between the vendors to try to create yet another standard 
that's that isn't tested. So using this as the as the appropriate standards body. It, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Dr. Ron Ross has done a great job yeah. in a lot of the process, of 853 and things like that. But the other thing is, we're seeing the same thing with the cell phones. They have to sit in the cell phone. Right. A lot of disconnect from the vendors that actually provide more secure systems, and a lot of the applications that we've seen, a lot of the cool. exploits have come from okay. things Again, enabled by Again, think default. presidential. NIST is absolutely correct. So, I mean, I mean, basically what I'm hearing is you're asking for regulation. When we grapple with this one, you know, our market incentives, you know, and we also get into these absolutely. long debates about do we have market failure when it comes to securing, whether it's data, proprietary data, critical infrastructure, what are the different levers that can be pulled or pushed to deal with this issue? So a presidential recommendation might say to the economists at Treasury or say to Commerce, you know, assign somebody to go dig into this and, and really figure out how can we move this ball forward. Go. When we talk about using procurement power, mm -hmm. You know, I've been listening to that debate for eight years, and government still hasn't really gotten there. Now, the federal desktop common configuration that you talked about right. is a step in the right direction, it's but they're big, getting big each, lever. Yeah. Each agency gets lots of mandates from uh, from the White House, uh, from various groups, and a lot of them often are unfunded. So that's where the agencies are somewhat challenged. Well, that's really what I'm looking at from a funding standpoint. Okay, you're getting bumped from behind. I think uh, you have an angry line. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, hopefully brief. Um, one is how how radical are the proposals that you're contemplating? You know, is is something like a Great Firewall of America is, you know, something that's on the table for for proposing to the president? We don't. The only big radical thing that we've been thinking about is to create a public-private partnership that would involve a board that's half appointed by the federal government, half appointed by the private sector, with an authority. That doesn't exist right now. There's, there's no nothing like that. And so that's probably the, the one that's really different. The rest of them are things that you would expect, things like how do you establish maybe a reorganization, funding, like the gentleman was talking about with NIST for authorities, a lot of tweaking in those areas. Um, we've, we're also teeing up the idea about education and educational funding. What was that I was getting? Thank you, sir. Um, but yes, we would love, if you've got a really cool, big, completely different idea, let us know. Uh, and then the other question I had is, are you leaning more towards um, the issues directly facing the federal government, military, defense contractors, or... Uh, broad spectrum. Broad, broad, broad spectrum. spectrum. Not. We're thinking of the nation here, okay? National cybersecurity. So it's you and me, as well as the federal government, trading partners, and others. This is a phenomenon of, of, our, of our generation, something we have to fix. Our kids and grandchildren put up with what we, we leave behind. And so if we don't get it right now, then they're going to be trying to undo our mess in the years to come, which is really kind of cool because we, yeah. we get to write the rules. Uh, and then as a grad student, I just like to save more research dollars. Awesome. Thank you. And that is on the list, by the way. Um, my recommendation as a professor, actually, more research dollars, but reality is we can't build this on a house of quicksand. And until we figure out what our principles are going to be, I think the first thing has to come up is some simple principles of things like we will be secure. I don't see that right now coming out of the federal government because different agencies have different definitions of what's important to them, and the end result is we're not secure. So somewhere there has to be some principles that say we'll be secure. Another principle is, and this works great in corporate America, eventually it filters to a decision authority. Let me hold you for just a second. If yeah. you walked into the president and said, Mr. President, we need to be more secure, Fair statement. Mr. President then says to you, what do you mean? What's your reply? What does it mean to be more secure in cyberspace? We need to stop shipping protocols, buying pro or stop shipping products, um, accepting protocols and things that have huge known gaping vulnerabilities. Well, that's just about everything that's out there. <laughs> well, wait, wait. I mean, Huge be honest with yourself. Gaping. What, what can you point out right now that doesn't do what you just described? Pods. Probably? Plain old telephone system. What's that? Wait, wait, wait. Can string, right? Wait, wait. It's a large network, and it's relatively secure. They're, one of the principles is there's no such thing as perfect security. I understand that. Right, but define security. In this, what, it, what is it or what is it not? Can you define it? Um, when something does exactly what it's supposed to do and only what it's supposed to do. Fair enough. Any other definitions? 
I'd have to think a little longer and then see Jerry the challenge. Kick me. See how hard this oh, is. I realize, but yeah. I, I'm not seeing the principles part coming up first, right? Of which, and the second part of the principles well, is just on, on the principle part. You know, I, I mentioned cyber doctrine. You got to have an o overarching right. doctrine, right? So yep. we actually came up with some draft recommended principles, overarching principles that can be taken or, or modified or what have you. So, you know, back to Mark's earlier comment, we are going to be making a lot of this stuff available for public comment and input. You know, so, you know, at that time, you know, take a look at what we've drafted. Right. You know, maybe we missed something because we're only, you know, a group of 30-plus uh, no. folks. And we'll have to stop and let the next person come up. But the idea of principles is absolutely sound. Okay. And the only other part with the principles yes. was a single voice. Yeah. If every department gets to have their interpretation. Right. We have, we have, we have chaos. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. So some of your earlier uh, comments about legislating what's good and bad code is a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing the government's really good at is taxing and spending. So um, let's go to the spending arena. What's currently being spent at the technology directorate of uh, Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate, is ridiculously underfunded. Doug yes, Maude's got nothing. It's less than 1% of the but entire budget. But I look at what Carl Landwehr's got at, uh, at uh, NSF is absolutely ridiculously underfunded. The current head of NSF is incompetent. Um, he Tell does. us how you really feel, sir. <laughs> I really feel he is incompetent. Uh, he's not spending the so money. So if you got into the Oval Office, so what would you tell Mr. President? So if I got into the Oval Office, the recommendation is put a lot of money into fundamental research, into defining the questions you've got for security. Get a governing board. You don't want a czar. You want a governing board, what you just said, yep. of private and government people together to come to how we spend that money and deploy that money for actual fundamental new technologies and security. It's so a money issue more There's than two anything. thoughts that we've been going down this road. One is that if you go back to just 1990, convenient starting point, roughly right before NSF and ARPANET integrated with everybody else, and now come to the present, the last 18 years, just as a little group there, we've spent close to a billion dollars on things that we could call cyber in the research community across NSF, DARPA, now Homeland Security, ARL, NF NRO. What have we gotten back from that? What's the ROI for your tax dollars that have been spent on research? Can we hold anything up? And yeah, there's, there's some really cool things there's that have come out. Things. There's also a lot of things that when the research was done, it didn't mean anything at the time. It's just sitting on the shelf. It's, it's hidden in a paper in an IEEE journal somewhere. When it was written back in 1994 or 95, nobody understood it. Great science, bravo, here's your award for your paper. If we go back today and pull that out, there might be a nugget or two sitting there that actually solves some of 2008's problems. And so one of our ideas is, is there a way we can create like a cold case to go back and look at all the old research, bring it forward, and what's there? Can we mine that? That's, instead that's of trying partial. to. And yeah. so that's the kind of thinking that's bold, it's different. And perhaps we can go down that road. And to, to another point to this is that the government, we've been real, when I was in government, we've been very good at being reactive to particular situations. We really need to get to that side where we're taking, being more preventive. And that's where research and things, thinking ahead for the long term solutions is the way to go. Right. Just so everybody knows, we only got about four minutes and then we're going to be moving over to a we'll, Q &A we'll stay with these four and then I think I we're going to be done. to run your slides back the other way. Which way do you want me to go? Uh, back to the coding. Which one? More. Number four? No, more. Keep going that way. Keep going. Keep going. Until we get to the thing where you said you're going to make uh, the little thing about coding. 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 Remember? Coding. Yeah, oh. you were going to make, make it impossible. There you go. Okay. Wait, wait. I nope. think it was the bottom. Nope. Nope. You were back. That one? There we go. There we go. Which one? Yep, right there. All of those. Ah, very good. Um, okay. I will suggest to you, sir, that this is a slippery slope. Yep, microphone. microphone. I'm not that tall. Something makes Pull it out. Me. Pull it out. Yep. Now you can't step away from the microphone. <laughs> um, um, I want to say that this is a slippery slope, yes. and it's a frightening slippery slope. Do you recognize this book and this story? I can't see it from here. It says True Names. Okay. No. Has anybody else in this room ever read True Names? Anybody read True Names? Show of hands. Yeah. Two, three people. Okay. I am telling you, you need to read this. This is a slippery slope. Yep. It's an evil path you are trying to go. You may be well-intentioned, but the moment you start saying, let's stop subversion, you stop good people yes. as well as bad. And the bad people are going to get around you. Mm -hmm. I spent 35 years being 
bad? Able to. Oh no, I'm a cold warrior. <laughs> You're one of the good ones, right? Kind of. <laughs> okay, okay. You're like my in mom. D&D Trust terms, everything I say, son. I am good, right? In D and D terms, I'm chaotic neutral. Right. There you go. <laughs> um, but it's important that you Is understand. Is that your name, chaotic neutral? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> That's how you're all an I am chaotic neutral. I don't do I am. That's for children. The important thing is I'm really very serious about this. It's a bad path. It's not the direction you should be going. Worrying about making it harder and harder for people to do things is bad. I don't want a PlayStation. I want a computer. I don't want a way to download porn Mm -hmm. and do nothing but look at porn all day. I want to be able to write code, and I want it to do what I want it to do. I don't want you to stop what you see on the slide is present day. And you're absolutely right. How do we build the future that we don't have to do this, but still provide the security, privacy, anonymity, all the things we want? That's our challenge. I just want the and, government and we've out. Got, we've got three people behind you. Unless you got a quick, what do you tell Mr. President? Goodbye. Let's have somebody who's not stupid. And thanks for all the fish. <laughs> Folks, we're going to have to stop right there. And I think that's going to do it. We're out of time. I, I got a quick question. Yeah, I, actually, it's a it's a re, it's a request more than a recommendation. Okay. Um, through the many assessments and forensics investigations I've performed with state and local governments, right. where the majority of the PII is for the people that are paying the taxes to protect this information, I would request that as part of your initiative, that you support funding and standards and guidance to local and state organizations to really help keep this problem to a minimum. I'm going to stop with you. You two guys just come see us. Thanks very much, folks. See you through the con.